up slip the lies one day at a time. Kimmy Kim and Elations Radio. They're here to get your day going fine. Kimmy Kim and Elations Radio. Kimmy Kim and Elations Radio. Kimmy Kim and Elations Radio. And here's your host. Miss Kim Robinson. Hey! Hey, I'm Dr. Scott, and I'm here with my good friends, Shelly Murdoch.
Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome to Let's Talk About It with Rhonda. I am actually expecting guests. Thank you. Thank you for that applause. I am actually expecting a guest. I'm going to fiddle paddle for a few minutes uh, while we wait for her to call in. So, our guest for today um, is Alpha V. Pelzer. She is truly awesome. She's going to come to you this evening with lots of energy, and I promise you are going to love her. She was actually one of my presenters for my 2018 Change Your Mind, Change Your Life Women's International webinar last year, and this year I actually changed the name, but she was one of the presenters uh, last year, and I followed her on actually everything, and she just brings so much life to her speaking and to her topics. So um, as we wait for her to call in, hopefully she will call in. She said, okay. I sent her the number. If you, you have to excuse me. It was my mix-up. I had the times down for 8.30 Central Standard Time, but the time actually should have been 7.30 Central Standard Time. So I had to update that information for her, so that is my fault. So how is everyone doing today? Yes, it is a Monday, but it is a happy and a blessed Monday. It's been a productive day. It's been a busy day, right? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read her um, bio while we wait for her to call in so we can get that out, out of the way. Equipping women to define, accept, and use their unique voice after abuse. Alpha T. Pelzer moved to Maryland from Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is a best selling author, keynote speaker, telesummit strategist, founder of the online Your Voice and Reactive Me community, VIP live streamer, and head script writer for Breaking Free International. As a mom of four, she has been known to break out into impromptu dance parties or karaoke moments with her three girls or watch WWE or movies with her son. I told you, she's come to us with lots, lots of energy. Okay? So I know that you are absolutely going to love her. Homelessness and molestation greatly affected her decision to motivate women and youth to find their unique voice. It is her mission to make it possible for women, for women to speak, create their own opportunities, and walk in their unique purpose. Women after abuse, after abuse go through numerous self harming acts with a seed of low self-esteem. <laughs> we know that there is no one-size-fits-all solution for helping women who have gone through abuse. So through e-courses, life events, books, and social media, Alpha Keys, Alpha Beef, I, I, I always jack her name up, I'm sorry, wants to touch and transform the lives of women globally, one woman at a time. Now, I know that was a mouthful, but she is on, so let me not uh, take up any more time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome out to the Pelzer. Good evening, good, good evening. evening, and thank you for having me. Oh, how beautiful! <laughs> how are you? I am doing great. How about yourself? I am wonderful, wonderful. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you loud and clear. For you, I have done your introduction, and I apologize for the time mix up again, and I thank you for jumping in and being ready. Oh, not a problem at all. I'm super excited. I was excited about it all day. That's why I was like, yes, I'm ready. Let's go. All right. The floor is yours. Awesome. You know, first and foremost, I always want to say thank you for the opportunity to to speak to the audience. I, 
I don't take it for granted being able to inspire and empower people as I, you know, connect with them. It's been an amazing journey, okay, to say the least. (laughs) It's definitely had its ups and downs, but it's been Mm -hmm. an amazing journey. And I would have to say that one of the key turning points for my journey was in 2015. Um, I am a single mother of four. And in 2015, I had a conversation with my oldest daughter about trust. Uh, At this time, we were, you know, already in Maryland. We had moved from Philadelphia. And I had gone through so many emotions because after finding out my girls had been molested, I went through this journey of trying to help them the best way that I could. But at the time, no one knew that I had been molested as a child. I was one of the ones that never said a word, never said anything at all. And it it really is set a different journey for me completely. So her and I having this conversation about trust, I blurted out that I had been molested as well. And it was a freeing moment for me. It was an awkward moment for her, uh, but it completely shifted everything else that I would do after that. Because after that, I would go and I would publish my, finally publish my first book after writing it for eight years. After that, I would go and actually be the face of my brand, even though I'm an introvert and I'm so behind the scenes. It allowed me to be in a different headspace. And how many of you know when you go and say, you know what? I'm going to go all in. I'm going to make this happen. I am I'm superwoman. And we kind of put on the cape and we stand in there and we're letting the wind just blow the cape. And we just think that we're hot stuff, right? And sure enough, December 31st, 2015, I am evicted from my home with my four children. And I said, no, but no, God, no. I said, this is supposed to be the year. You know, this is 2016 was, is my year. That's, I'm going to get things done this year. And it, it almost felt like that question was coming up. Oh, are you really? <laughs> Are you really going to get some stuff done? I had a decision to make on January 1st. Do I have my pity party? Because, you know, we good for having a pity party and, 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 you know, what was me? Nothing ever goes right. Or do I move forward and take a flight that I had already planned? And, man, I said, okay, I'm going to go take this flight. I go ahead. I take the flight. First flight, great. My layover, there's no group number on my ticket. So I go over to the booth and I let them know, hey, there's no no group number on my ticket. They said, okay, no problem. Just go in with group two. I said, okay. They call up group two. I get in line. And then I hear my name over the loudspeaker. And I get out of the line. I go back over to the booth. And they hand me a new ticket. It's first class. And that moment forever changed how I showed up for things after that moment because I never know when I'm going to show up for something and get my first class ticket. I never know when something else greater than what I was looking for is waiting for me at my destination. That was everything, okay? That was everything. And even when I I hear myself talk about it now, it's like, it sounds surreal. It sounds like a movie. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like that didn't really happen. That was a movie. You watched that on on something on Netflix. (laughs) I just dreamed it up. You just dreamed that up. But that is what actually happened. And in the midst of that, I fought for everything after that. 
I fought to to publish the first book, and that was published in twenty six in March of twenty sixteen. Uh, the second book came out in June of twenty sixteen, and the third book came out later that year. It was like back to back, but it was because I fought in the beginning. And I said, I was not going to take no for an answer. I was not going to just allow what happened to me to be my story. Good, and so that part, right? Here I am, this little introvert, this little shy person that's always behind the scenes. I'm going to come out into the front and I'm going to do all types of fun stuff, right? Speaking on stages mm-hmm. and live streaming and Man, the first time I went live and did a live stream video on Periscope, I was shaking. I was not looking at the camera. (laughs) Uh, All the hearts going up, right? (laughs) Right? It was like, what were you thinking? Who told you this was a good idea? Um, But it was – it. It propelled me. Everything that I said yes to, uh, everything that I went ahead and stepped up to the plate, it it propelled me into something even greater than what I could imagine. And, man, I, I look at that and I look now, here I am, three years later, I've been able to leave my full-time job. I've been able to, you know, work at home and, and, and do stuff with my children. And and it's not always going to be easy. There's been some bumps in the road. But, man, if I would not have said yes and went and took that flight, where would I be now? That's correct. That is correct. So how do you speak to women now who are, who are passing through where you've already passed through? meaning that they maybe they have not actually confronted or dealt with the fact that they've been abused or even maybe one of their children have been abused. Like, how do you do that? So one of the things that I deal with is, is I work with women that have been through abuse, and it, it's, it's always a journey of I have to be honest about where I am in order for me to move forward. And I think about it as, you know, from the football field. I have to know that this is, you know, second down. This is the third. This is I need to know where I am because I need to know how much further I need to go in order to get that next first down. And what ends up happening is a lot of times, us, especially us as women, is we've been taught to weather the storm. We've been taught to put our head down and just weather the storm, not really pay attention to where you are, just fight through it. Just If you could just fight through it, then you'll be okay. And that's not, that's not right. That's why a lot of women are going through low self-esteem and depression, and they're going through all of these different emotional um, issues and emotional concerns and it's so much because we've been trying to carry this burden that we didn't need to carry. So I always tell them the first thing is you need to determine where you are. It's okay if you're not fully healed from it, but know and stand in that so you know how to move forward. It's okay if you still feel a little bitterness, but know that. Be mm-hmm. honest about that with yourself because the reality is, is the the worst thing that you can try to be is is someone who is saying you're better, but you're trying to help other people, but you still have bitterness because you're poisoning okay. the people you're coming in contact with. Okay. And when it comes to that abuse, that's what we do. When we have not healed from it, we're poisoning other people as we come in contact with them, not on purpose. We're not purposely trying to hurt them. We're not purposely trying to destroy our family. We're not purposely trying to destroy our relationships. But it happens because there's an open wound that has not been healed yet. And it takes some time. Sometimes every open wound is not going to be able to just, you can't just fix it with peroxide and a Band-Aid. 
Sometimes you need some stitches. Sometimes you need some crutches because you can't walk on that. Correct, correct. Now, have you encountered an experience where the abuse has been repeated and having to help break that cycle? I have. Um, one of the things that I've said, especially with in the coaching industry, is I'm very honest with people who come to me. Uh, if you, if you're beyond the scope of what I can handle, if you're beyond, if you're beyond the scope of where I see you being able to get started, then I will tell you you need you need to go and talk to a therapist. It is a hard conversation to have with people. Because especially in the African American community, that's still a naughty word. Okay. It's still a yeah. matter of what what goes on in this house stays in this house. Yeah. And I often tell yeah. people it, it's like it's like there's a gift box that's fully wrapped on the mantle. Everybody sees the gift box there, but nobody wants to talk about what's in the box. But everybody yeah. sees it. But it's, it's hushed tones when you talk about the fact that the box is still there, the fact that it's st- nobody's opened it, nobody has moved it, nobody has done anything with it. It's still there. And it's because that as a culture, that's what we've been taught. And it's been passed down okay. and passed down. And so we have to get to a point where we break that habit. And in order to do that, that may mean talking to someone who is unbiased. Someone who can sit down and and say, okay, this is this is where that's stemming from. This is this is what we need to deal with. Because honestly, we are, like I said, we we put our heads down and we just try to weather the storm. A lot of times, we try to just bury it and, and move forward. That's it. That was one of the things I was going to say, because I know for myself, I haven't been in this situation, but for myself, when it's talking about um, facing issues maybe that I feel is painful, like you said, I will bury it, or I just don't like to deal with my emotions. So, you know what I mean? Because emotions can be a lot sometimes, you know what I mean? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. I I originally went to school for um, social behavioral health, and so I took a lot of psychology classes, and I was going to school for social work. And I said, oh, you know, one of the things I do is I'm always getting, you know, training in different areas and different arenas because I know that it helps my clients by me going and getting these certifications and going and, and learning the different techniques that, that therapists and, and social workers are using when they're talking to people. But not everybody does that. And what I found, okay. which is, is, is really painful, is that a lot of people are going and connecting with coaches, and because coaches don't have that training, they're being re-abused. They're, they're, they're being triggered. Okay. Oh, that's not good. And and it's so it's happening a lot more. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's happening a lot more than what it's being talked about. It's not being discussed, but this is what is happening is that women are getting into programs and these triggers are being, you know, thrown at them because that particular coach was not necessarily a good fit. Not to say that they did not have the strategy, that they did not have the know-how and the wisdom, no, they had all of that. But you always got to be mindful about your triggers. You have to be mindful about, again, that's why we start off with where you are because you're not going to be able to handle everything, and it ends up, uh, you know, we end up breaking down, and then we can't understand why we haven't moved forward in our business. We can't understand why we haven't moved forward in our personal life, that part. Right. Now, so, and I'm, I'm sure that the abuse can put um, different people in different states of mind 
as far as depression, uh, PTSD, uh, anxiety, all of those things. So, and I'm sure for each one, it requires like different uh, steps, if you will, different processes, right? And I'm not sure for some women it takes longer than it may for others. And even for the young girls, I guess there's just no way to measure. Because that's something that you cannot get over, but I guess there's no way to really measure, like, your, uh, when you come to a terms with it or when you come, I don't know, I'm trying to get my words together. Uh, I guess when you, you, you better live with it, you know what I mean, or better accept it or move on from it. Does that make sense? Right. So there is, is everybody has a different, um, a different healing journey. And, you know, one person, it may take them six months and, you know, they, they have a more normalized um, journey. And for someone else, it may take them six years. There are a few factors that really play into it. Um, uh, for one is, you know, the support that you have really plays into that healing process. A lot of times we feel by okay. ourselves. I know for uh-huh. me, the reason I had not told anybody was because when it happened, I was a child. And at the time I was not okay. living with my mother. My mother was going and getting her degree. So I was living with an aunt and it happened. It didn't happen at my aunt's. It happened at one of my aunt's friend's house. So it was, I didn't want to bring that to my mother because my mother's working on a better life for us. And even though I was young, first, second grade, that that was my mentality was I had to be strong for us. My mom was being strong for us. I had to be strong for us. And for me, it took me from that first, second grade little girl to that age of 35 that when I said something about it, that's when another piece of the healing really took place. For my girls, it was okay. different. We found out early on. They were three and five at the time. We found out early on. And this, so they had therapy. They've had support. You know, along the way, they've had we've had conversations about it. We've had now. Is it easy? No, it's not. Because when we think about women who have gone through abuse, there's some opposite ends of the spectrum where they can be an overachiever. They can be um, those who are addicted to drugs. They could be those who become um, um, strippers. They could be, and and I've I, I know. These are the extremes because I've had people come and talk to me about them finding out, you know, once their daughter was an adult, them finding out that the daughter was molested or that the daughter was raped, you know, by an ex that they, you know, that they had or something and them being able to correlate the fact that their child is now a stripper to mm-hmm. what that child, what she went through when she was a child, the drug addiction, okay. you know, that's their coping mechanism. And and the thing about it is, is, we always go and talk about the drug addiction. We talk about the, you know, the opioids, and we talk about the alcohol, but we forget to talk about the sex addiction. We forget to talk about the the addiction to validation. There's so many different other ways that it comes out. And so okay. it's it's always the process of the biggest piece of it is what what does your support look like? Um, are they allowing you the space to to grow and learn about what you know what really happened to you? Are they having the conversations with you? Um, which is really hard as a parent to you know nobody wants to sit down with their middle school child and you know have. You already have to have the conversation, right? But on top of that, you have to go and say, these are the emotions that you may be going through when somebody says this to you. 
this is the mindset that you may have when somebody does this to you. It's not always easy. Yeah. That's just, it is, I don't know if there's a percentage or uh, an average or, like, so how does, uh, like, the, the, uh, I want to say the percentage of women who have been sexually abused or commit suicide, I guess they would differ at age, at the age group. Um, man, it's it's crazy because when you look at the, yeah, the numbers are, and even when we look at the numbers, the numbers are skewed because there are a lot of people that don't really, that don't say anything, they don't speak up. So there's one in four females, so one in four women have been abused. So if you come from a sibling group of four girls, one has gone through abuse, but because we don't know that, it it does lead to that extreme of you know sometimes that's that's they feel as though that's their only way out. They feel as though they're their family secret. They feel as though they don't really have anybody to talk to, and so there are a lot that turn to suicide. But it's normally that they'll turn to suicide after they've turned to something else. Okay. Okay. So they 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 turn to drugs and alcohol, and it leads to suicide. It does. It leads to suicide when there is, um, especially in younger children, and and because we and unfortunately we've seen a big boost in suicide uh, when it comes to middle school and even elementary school students. Mm -hmm. That's usually when it comes to, you know, somebody finding out about that situation and them being bullied about it. And it leads to that extreme. Yeah, and it leads to that extreme, um, which is really painful because, again, you if if I could go to the school and, and just stand there with a sign that says, Hey, if if you've been abused, you have you have somebody to listen to you. You have somebody who understands. I, I would do it. I would be the crazy mom standing there with the big old sign. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I can't I can't write for anything. My handwriting is horrible, so it would be a horrible looking sign. And uh, okay. I, but I would be that. I would be that mom because I know I know where it can lead. So what or if anything can society do more of, do better of, do less of when it comes to handling victims of sexual abuse? What do you think about that? So one of the biggest things, and it's right up there with mansplaining, is telling someone where they should be at in their healing journey. Mm -hmm. You should just get over it. You know, it's that idea of pulling yourself up by your own bootstrap. Get over it. It happened this amount of years ago but you don't know what their healing journey looks like. So the incident may have happened years ago, but they may not have started their healing until just this year. They may not have started their healing until, you know, a few years ago. There's a process that you have to really go through in that healing process. You know, listen, I got to stop denying that it happened. I have to, be honest and open. I have to find somebody that I can sit and talk to. I have to, you know, I have to stop blaming myself. You know, I have to put the blame on where the blame is due, and I can't blame myself for it. And so there's a whole process. So we never go to someone and say, you should be at this level. You should be here. No, Mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way. And so as a society, that's one of the biggest things is we, we 
you can't tell somebody where they should be at in their healing journey. And then the other piece is, you know, <laughs> my auntie, one of my aunties, she calls it the shut up ministry. And she said everybody should be a part of it. Yeah, everybody should be a part of the shut up ministry sometimes. Sometimes people Uh, just need to be able to vent. They just need to talk. They don't really want you to give an opinion. Yeah. Right? They don't really want them. They don't want your two cents. They just need a space, a safe space where they can vent and where they can talk. And where when they talk and they vent, their their information is not going to come up on uh, CNN news. <laughs> but they just have that open opportunity, that space. And it's okay if that's not you. Be honest and say if that's not you, <laughs> if you're not the one that can carry that burden, because sometimes it feels like a burden. If you can't carry that, be honest and say, I can't carry that for you. But what I can do is I can help you find someone that can. Sometimes that can that can go so much further than you sitting there and listening and then you going back and gossiping or you sitting and listening and wanting to give you two cents. Now, you don't need to do all that. Sometimes you just need to be a listening ear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That makes a whole lot of sense. But, but for whatever reason... There's too many people who can't do that or who can't say that I'm not the person that you should be having this conversation with. Right, because then then I'm putting the the light on me and saying something wrong with me. Correct. Correct. (laughs) So how do we close out this conversation um, to... know how they can find you if they want to use your services for their healing process. Sure. So what I want to say to you, if you are listening and and you see yourself as saying, you know what, I'm ready to go through this process. I'm ready to start this healing process. I'm ready to tell my story. I'm ready to have my voice heard. Then definitely connect. Uh, you can go to uh, bit.ly forward slash talk to Alta you can get on the phone with me. Uh, or if you're not at that point, I, I just want you to just come and follow me. Come and connect with me online. I'm always sharing some motivation. I'm always sharing support simply because I know everybody's not in, they're not there yet. So I understand that. So if you look me up, um, you can look up World Voice League on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn, and you can catch me at any one of those locations. Understand that you're not alone. You're not. I know know you feel like you may be. I know sometimes it may seem like you may be the only one in the room, but you're not the only one on this journey. And the most important piece is you getting on that that healing journey so that way you you can go ahead and live your best life. That's what it's always about, is is being able to live your best life ever. That's good. That's real good. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis, for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Oh, my goodness. I was so excited. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. I know for a fact that you'll help someone today, whether they're listening live now or they're listening to, whether they're listening to the replay, I know that this will definitely help someone. I appreciate you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, it's every time... I see someone, you know, just just get the help they need or or just move forward and and being able to talk about what they've been through or share their story, be a speaker, write the book, whatever it is that your journey is going to lead you to, that that warms my heart. Like there's nothing else I would rather be doing as my full-time business. There's nothing else. 
Should be 